So the last smartphone that I reviewed was the Google Pixel 8. In fact, I'll leave a link down below if you're interested in checking it out. And right after that, I switched to the Galaxy S24 Ultra. I'm currently working on the long-term review for this smartphone, so expect that sometime in the next few months. But as I was testing this phone, I realized, man, I'm actually holding something that costs almost $2,000 Canadian. Like this thing is $1299 US, which is roughly $1,800 Canadian, which is a lot of money for a smartphone. I was actually doing some research and I came across this, the Motorola G Play. It's currently priced at $150 Canadian, which roughly translates to $100 US, which is actually a pretty sweet deal for a smartphone. But I really wanted to see for myself if it's actually worth anything in 2024. So Uh, it just feels like navigating through a maze here at Costco. Absolutely. I don't even know where this phone is. I think I found it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We stored it. All right, let's quickly unbox this thing. And the first thing I noticed is that this phone comes with a charger in the box, which surprised me by a long shot, considering the whole package only cost me 150 bucks. My S24 Ultra just came with a phone and a cable, not even a fast charger in the box, which is crazy considering the price. I think I jumped the gun a little too early on this one because I ended up picking the 2023 model of the Moto G Play, but instead there's actually a 2024 model uh, for about the same price with better specs and it's available on Best Buy, not Costco. So what I have to do is go to Best Buy, pick up the newer phone, transfer all the content from the older phone, uh, and go back to Costco, get a refund for this one. This is what happens when you just are impatient and you decide to do things. Well, that was pretty straightforward. I got the phone, it's completely unlocked, didn't have to go through any restrictions or unlocking process. Um, the lady at Best Buy was super nice, but now that we have the 2024 G Play, let's go back to the studio and do unboxing round two okay so here we go again the unboxing experience feels pretty similar from last year with one major difference this time around motorola decided to not include the power adapter in the box which honestly is a bit of a letdown now i've spent a week playing around with this phone and i've got to say i'm really impressed with what 150 dollars can get you the first thing that stood out to me was the form factor it's almost the same size as the galaxy s24 ultra now despite its plastic construction it's polished to perfection, especially in this gorgeous sapphire blue color. It has a really nice sheen to it, and from a distance, it looks like a premium smartphone. I also appreciate the minimal camera bump. It's a pleasure to hold in my hands, plus no more rocking on the table. It's also lightweight, considering the materials used here. Surprisingly, build quality exceeded my expectations with tactile buttons and a fast, uh, accurate fingerprint sensor that's cleverly integrated into the power button. It's a refreshing departure from the trend of in-display readers. It even comes with a headphone jack. You see, seeing this on a modern smartphone after years feels like reconnecting with an old friend. It's a nostalgic reminder of simplicity and convenience in a tech world that's always chasing the next big thing. Uh, this phone is also water repellent, uh, not waterproof, uh, so I wouldn't recommend fully submerging it in water. It can withstand light rain and splashes without any issues. Question, why is it so cold in here? Well, I got new coolers installed. Turns out they're a little too good. They're meant for computers, you know that, right? I got them in every room. Hey, <laughs> the price is just too good. I guess the large VRM fans help with cooling. Yeah, plus the pivoting connection hoses are wonderful. I do love the styles and different sizes too. The new Arctic Freezer 3 AIOs. Please use on CPUs only. They are specifically optimized for LGA 1700 and AM54. <laughs> Check them out below. All right, have fun with your freezer. <laughs> Let's talk about this display real quick. It's not gonna blow your socks off or anything. It's just a 6.5 inch IPS HD screen with a 90 Hertz refresh rate. Nothing too fancy in terms of specs, but you know what? That's all right, because it's all about achieving the balance here. The colors, they're pretty solid, not too flashy, but they get the job done. It's not gonna offer vibrant and inky black levels of performance like an OLED display, but that's okay. You don't need it. And the text is sharp enough for reading without squinting, which is again, all you need. Even though it's only a 720p resolution, uh, it packs in more pixels per inch than some cheap desktop monitors that you see around. When it comes to watching YouTube or binging on Netflix, 
It's a smooth sailing. I mean, playback is smooth and the bigger screen actually provides a more immersive experience. You can also take it outside on a sunny day and still see what's happening on the screen just fine thanks to the peak brightness setting uh, of around 500 nits. You find two speakers on this phone, one at the bottom and uh, one at the top, which also functions as an earpiece. Together, these actually create a nice stereo soundstage, especially highlighting the higher tones. Although the bass response isn't as strong and qual quality is pretty solid and the reception was pretty strong. Now, keep in mind that this phone doesn't support 5G, but you know what? That's okay too, because I was still able to get around using Google Maps checking email and killing time on Instagram using LTE just fine. So from a physical standpoint, I think it's safe to say that the Moto G check marks all the basics that you would look for in a smartphone. But what about performance? Because that's an important factor to tie in with the user experience. I'm not talking about having the fastest chip with wicked fast, buttery, smooth animations and having 25 apps running in the background. Remember, this is a $150 smartphone. So what can you realistically expect? Well, I'm actually kind of glad I picked up last year's Moto G Play in the first place to begin with because when I tested out this phone, I mean, it really tasted my patience. I frequently had UI freezes and it was impossible to actually use the smartphone. It took a few seconds for the keyboard to pop up. I honestly didn't enjoy it that much because it only had a MediaTek G37 CPU with three gigabytes of RAM and 32 gigabytes of storage, which let's face it, isn't enough storage to store all of my apps and data. I actually ended up deleting a lot of my photo editing apps like Photoshop, Fitbit, Kijiji, Lightroom, LinkedIn, and a bunch of other apps just to make some space on this phone uh, to hopefully increase performance, but that didn't really do that much. The 2024 model is an absolute game changer. I mean, it's kind of crazy the kind of performance you can get within just a span of a year. First off, it's equipped with Qualcomm's Snapdragon 684 G CPU, boasting four gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage, which is a pretty big upgrade. Now, with the addition of RAM Boost utilizing the internal storage to cache infrequently used data, this combination of a faster chip and increased RAM just really elevates the phone's performance. I haven't experienced any UI freezes, albeit sometimes there are occasional hiccups with apps like YouTube and Instagram becoming unresponsive to touch inputs, but a quick close and reopen usually does a trick. Uh, it does take a few seconds to open an app, but once you're in, it runs pretty smooth. Now, there are certain steps that I would recommend to make the phone run just a bit faster. Um, firstly, I would get rid of all the fancy widgets running on the home screen since that does consume memory. I would also switch to a static wallpaper instead of dynamic options that come pre-installed on the phone. This just eliminates the stress on the GPU. I also learned another tip from Reddit where you can set background processing limits, which can also help boost performance slightly. You can also set the animation speed from 1x to 0.5x, which I think is the first thing that you should do with any smartphone. It just significantly enhances how the elements on the screen react to your touch input. Now, 64 gigs of storage is a pretty generous upgrade for storing all of your photos and videos, but if that isn't enough, this phone actually comes with a built-in micro SD card slot that enables you to expand your storage up to a terabyte. In fact, I found this 256 gig micro SD card for less than 30 bucks on Amazon, so that's a quick and cheap option to offset some of your data. Now, keep in mind that you can't install apps on this SD card, but for the majority of consumers who just need the basics, it's a pretty sweet setup. When it comes to gaming performance, now let's set the expectations straight. This is a $150 smartphone, so it won't rival a $1,000 flagship. But the reality is, it actually handles popular games like Monopoly Go, Subway Surfers, Roblox, and FIFA Mobile surprisingly well. Now, while it may not achieve the fastest frame rates for gaming enthusiasts, for everyday users, enjoying mainstream titles during their downtime, I mean, this thing is a solid win in my books. Now, the software experience on the Moto G Play has a lot of similarities to my Google Pixel 8 just by looking at the lock screen and the home screen layout. The quick settings drawer also looks very similar as well, so the transition was pretty seamless for me. There are some apps preloaded onto the phone from Motorola, and you also get some other apps like TikTok, Facebook pre-installed. Now, some of these apps from Motorola feature tutorials on how to personalize the phone, as well as learn all the gestures that come with it. There is a Moto Secure app that lets you add secure folders and a bunch of other privacy enticing features. It's there if you need it. If you don't need it, you can leave it alone. Honestly, uh, I'm really glad that Motorola went with a minimalistic approach here. They're not throwing a bunch of features at the wall to see which one would stick. Uh, you can respond to emails, navigate Google Maps, listen to music on Spotify. Look, it does 90% of the things that a $1,000 smartphone can do. 
But there is one big problem. You see, this phone is running on Android 13, an operating system that's two years old. Motorola hasn't made any commitments to update this to version 14 anytime soon, and I'm doubtful they will. Now, while you may receive occasional security patches, the reality is we're living in a digital era where security is critical, and I can't shake the feeling that this phone could become vulnerable to security threats later in the future. There might also be compatibility issues with apps later down the line, and performance could also suffer without any updates. We're witnessing many smartphone manufacturers like Samsung, OnePlus, and Google promising over five years of Android updates for their premium flagship devices, but I can't help but think, why can't the more affordable models receive similar attention? I mean, just look at Apple, even their cheapest iPhone, a four-year-old model, uh, still supports their latest operating system. It seems like there's a need for change here. Now, on the contrary, battery life on this phone is truly exceptional. And I think most of you saw that coming since the Snapdragon SoC barely sips power. I mean, the standby time is incredible. Motorola has been generous to uh, pack this phone with 5,000 million powers, which can easily provide me six to seven hours of screen on time. I mean, I can't recall my iPhone lasting that long. Now, I intentionally tested this phone with various demanding tasks like using Google Maps to get around the city, um, playing YouTube for several hours, extended browsing sessions, and social media engagement for the channel and it handles all of them effortlessly. Now for more basic functions like text messaging, making phone calls and email, I'm actually confident that this phone can last even longer. Now, while wireless charging isn't included, which is totally understandable at this price point, the wired charging speeds top out at 15 watts. It just sucks that they didn't include the power adapter in the box. So I guess the last thing to cover here is camera performance. Notice I said camera and not cameras, because unlike the major competitors, this phone prioritizes a streamlined experience over cramming in countless features into its camera software. Nowadays, it seems like half of the product announcements are centered around software features with cameras and AI stuff. Whereas here, you're just greeted with a single 50 megapixel f1.8 sensor. Now, don't be fooled by the dual lens housings at the back. While it may appear to have two sensors from a distance, one of them houses the actual sensor and the other is an LED flashlight. <laughs> it's a sneaky move, Motorola. Now, out of the box, the photos captured by this camera are downscaled to 12.5 megapixels. Now, this is done to conserve storage space, but it's nothing new. A lot of flagship smartphones do the same thing too. Now, under really good lighting conditions, the images boast pretty good detail, albeit with some noticeable post-processing enhancements. For instance, if you take a look at this image over here, you can easily discern the license plate and the detail around that, yet the wet roads exhibit an overly smoothed appearance, as if somebody took some Vaseline and just applied all over it. Now, I can get super technical about the camera performance, but honestly, guys, I don't think it's gonna do any justice, especially for what you're getting for just $150. This camera isn't tailored for photography enthusiasts, but rather, it caters for those seeking a simple point and shoot experience. It's low light performance leaves something to be desired with potential for noise and sometimes it can throw off white balance in extreme conditions. The video quality is also commendable. While it's only limited to shooting at 1080p at 30 frames per second, it's more than capable of capturing, you know, those precious moments shared with your friends and family. You see, the Moto G Play embodies the essence of practicality and affordability. It's not the best at everything that you would expect from a $1,000 smartphone, but instead, it offers a reliable experience. Now sure, it's not gonna feel like a piece of jewelry in your hand, but most people who tend to put a case on their phone won't even notice it. The display is good enough for all the essential tasks, the performance is commendable, the battery life is outstanding, and the cameras are pretty decent. I can still tend text messages, make phone calls, I mean, it covers 90% of the tasks one would expect from a flagship smartphone with the remaining 10% compromising mostly of unnecessary fluff that many users won't utilize. I mean, a good example is the S24 Ultra. I mean, how many of you actually use the 1000 or 100X space zoom feature on their cameras? Or even the stylus. I mean, I don't think I've even used a stylus. I mean, this is probably the first time I'm pulling it out of the phone after testing it or while testing it. It's things like these that, it's sure, it's nice to have, but you don't necessarily need it. If you wanna get a little bit more out of a smartphone, by all means, you can spend 50, 100, $150 more to get a faster device and perhaps a better camera setup. But this phone is a great starting point for anyone looking for a gateway to the digital world. It's not just a phone, it's basically a ticket for limitless possibilities without breaking the bank. 
And I want to hear from you guys. Do you think phones like the Moto G Play still have relevance in today's fast-paced world? Chime in the comments down below. I'm Ibar with Hardware Connects. Thanks so much for watching. And I will talk to you guys in the next one. And don't forget to spend responsibly.